This episode is sponsored by DS, a team of makers, marketers, and entrepreneurs that help businesses transform their brand experience and unlock growth like never before. Are you a CMO, founder, or business leader looking to level up your brand and marketing? Head over to WeRDS.com and let's explore what is next for your business. That's W-E-A-R-E-D-S dot com. Visit us to learn more. Hey, what's going on, entrepreneurs? This is Robert Roach, executive producer for Forward Obsessed. And if you are building businesses, you know that you never have enough resources to get everything done that you need to get done for your new business. All right, and that's why we're proud to say that one of our sponsors is Das Good. That's D-A-A-S Good. Das Good is a done-for-you, creative, on-demand service for entrepreneurs. This is for businesses who need great creative without a huge budget and without a lot of time to focus on it. If you want to get the important things done like pitch decks, awesome branding, incredible websites, but you want to do it without the hassle, or without the headaches, without the massive budget, then Das Good is for you. Head over to dasgood.design. That's D-A-A-S good.design. Mention that Ford Obsessed sent you and save $1,000 off of your first month of service. Let us know what you think of them. We're excited to hear about it. And with that, enjoy the show. Remember, stay Ford Obsessed. Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Forward Obsessed, where we deep dive into the journey of entrepreneurs to give you the unvarnished realities that they go through. Before we get started, please be sure to hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're on, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or otherwise. Also, be sure to check out our sponsors in the description. They support us, and hopefully you can support them. Today, we welcome Jason Kirby, an incredible entrepreneur that would go through some incredible journeys, some ups and downs, the roller coasters that we always talk about. Jason would start a photography business in college that he would pivot into an online marketplace and almost sell to Kodak. He would then go on to exit that business and join as a co-founder of a business called Liquid Sky in the gaming space. Liquid Sky would have multiple near failures, but get acquired by Walmart. Post-acquisition by Walmart, Jason would go on to start a venture capital company called Thunder VC, where he would use state-of-the-art technology mixed with his incredible experiences to fund new startup companies. Jason takes us through all the trials and tribulations of his career so far, losing his hair, dealing with near acquisitions, multiple opportunities of failure, and he would come out on top. It was a great journey speaking with Jason. We're really excited to share this with you make sure you tune in to Forward Obsessed. Hello and welcome to this episode of Forward Obsessed. I'm your co-host, David Salinas, of course, joined by... Pete Senna. Today we have with us Jason Kirby, coming in from New Jersey, originally born and raised in Texas. Uh, No, excuse me, born in Texas, raised in Southern California. Southern California. Jason, welcome to the show. No, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. So, Jason, uh, every show we start off with the same beginning, uh, we want to know where did the entrepreneurial kernel in your life come from? Uh, we usually like to go back as far as you can remember when you were a child. Tell us about your parents, uh, your 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 close family, and where you, where you think you saw entrepreneurship yeah. entrepreneurship first. No, I'm happy to do so. So for me, I had no idea what entrepreneurship was uh, until I was like 19. But I, you know, reflecting back, kind of had like little signs of it. Started like a GeoCities websites and like trying to like do things. They were not real businesses by any means, but I was like building and like trying to create stuff. Uh, did not know what the concept of entrepreneurship was or even the idea of owning a business. My dad worked in finance. He worked at a bank. That's all I knew. My mom worked at the school. I uh, just had no exposure to that world at all. And uh, it wasn't until my first year of college, I'm doing a, a finance degree at San Diego State. It's, you know, kind of whatever wasn't super intrigued by my finance professors uh, and a close family friend who was in real estate and, you know, kind of like the rich dad, poor dad, you know, like my dad's the poor dad, he's the rich dad. Um, and <clears throat> he exposed me to that, that book in particular. And that summer got out of my freshman year and I just, the whole, everything just clicked. I was like, this is like the missing piece of information that I needed to understand, like business ownership and the value of investing and just like 
that whole world, like the corporate world and like getting a job, just looking at my dad, it's just all I knew. So that's the path I was on, but it never made sense to me. And so after that summer, I think I read about nine books that summer uh, when I was 19 and I just started my first business a month later in October. And it was just like filing a business. It was like, oh, I'm going to like, I'm a real business now. Uh, it was a photography business because one thing I learned from my friend or family friend was do what you love mm. and everything else will follow. And so I was like, well, I love photography in high school. It was a lot of fun. I would love to do it more. Don't really know if that's a real business or not, but let me just start a business and go from there. So I did all the paperwork, but never actually did any sales or anything like that. But happened to get like a actually sizable contract to me back then it was like a $2,000. That's why for our first deal, so we paid two grand to do like a calendar photo shoot for a sorority. Awesome. Uh, not a bad yeah, it was a sure. great opportunity and uh, so it was a ton of fun And but I started like actually applying lessons learned in school like my grades and performance in school just skyrocketed because just everything started clicking I looked at everything from a business owner perspective and um, uh, so that ultimately that interaction with a family friend uh, led to just so many doors opening for me from like just a mental exposure perspective uh, so I started that first business in college just as a means to learn and apply myself. Ended up becoming a real business, which was never expected. But while in college, I worked full-time jobs. I worked at the you know, Ritz camera to get discounts, you know, kind of thing. It was like the camera store in town. Um, and just kept trying to like fuel the learning towards my business and apply everything towards it. And from there, uh, got a job at a marketing consultancy as an intern. Uh, it was like the internship to get in San Diego. It had the most robust, it was unpaid, but it was like, they gave you so much knowledge and immersed you uh, with knowledge. And so I learned all the basics of like SEO, PPC, this is 2008. So it's like real on the, you know, on the cusp of all this stuff coming out, uh, just conversion rate optimization and all these things. So I just got a huge education on, on that front. And then shortly after concluding that internship. They uh, offered me a full-time job to kind of run a vertical for them and do sales because uh, I was looking for sales jobs. And that taught me a ton. I built, took me two years while in college working full-time, but I built it up to about a half a million dollar year business for them uh, doing cold calls. And then cold calls suck so much. I learned how to do inbound digital marketing. To, you know, <laughs> and I got onto like, I had like webinars. So before podcasts were a thing, I did webinars with like thought leaders and stuff like that. And I'm like 21 you know, 22 with like 55 year olds, like coming up my, <laughs> my webinars. Uh, so I learned a lot, uh, going through that experience, but got paid absolute dirt, you know, working there. I was like an intern, unpaid intern, happy to make a few grand, but, uh, realized I was making way more money on my business on the side and, uh, decided to, you know, go full time on my business. I launched one of the first Groupons in Southern California. So when Groupons were all like cool and whatnot, I was the first one to do a, like a photography class. I had a, oh, I'd started a photography school while working at that uh, agency. Mm -hmm. Is this before uh, purchasing San Diego Photography Classes dot com with a hell of an SEO domain name? It was that's what triggered it. I was my friend was a internet marketer. He was a, another intern. He got me the internship at that agency. And then he started his own agency, like just small shop, and he was doing like a a lesson for small business owners. And I was there for like moral support. You know, he's a couple years older than me. He's a good friend and. Um, in that class itself, I was like, oh, SEO, I was like in the Google keyword tool, like, like, oh, what can I do with photography? And I saw like, there was no, uh, there was huge demand and no competition for San Diego photography classes. And I was just like, boom, like no competition at all. Uh, everything that was a com competitor was either go to college and get a photography degree or take this weird dude's like $3,000 weekend course. There's a, there's an interesting thing that comes up for me. So one when there's demand and lack of supply, obviously it can be booming, right? So when we think about when we ask a search engine or ask ChatGPT, it's, it's an ask, right? Great leaders know that business development and sales is the the key to every business, right? It seems like business development came really easy to you. I know it came really easy to him because he's my co-founder. It didn't come really easy to me. And I know a lot of listeners on this show, it doesn't come really easily to. So help us understand how do you cultivate a mindset of asking and being able to build a career where you're good at business development. Because let's be real, if you can't close, you're not gonna have a business, whether you're San Diego Photography Classes .com or selling coffee mugs or launching the next, you know, Google competitor. So unpack that for us a little bit because I can hear there's just there's a bit of a gravitas that you're that you're sharing. I can tell it's from the young age, you just came with it. 
I wouldn't say I was like a sales guru by any means, but I read a ton. So little bit, little red book of sales, like or little red, yeah, from read Jeffrey Gatomer, like way back when. Um, I just try to figure it out, and I fortunately had an avenue to apply my learning. So I think that's one of the most important things. It's one thing to read the books, but if you don't actually get to apply it, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so and repetition, like cold calls sucked. I am not a cold guy. Like I, I did it. I followed the scripts, created the scripts, worked on it. Like, and I had great mentors as another thing is just bring on people that know what you're trying to accomplish and either are incentivized to help you and, or want to help you. And for, for that group, it was both. So I had really good mentorship and leadership to kind of start learning these very important, you know, I guess called training these muscles, these sales muscles early on. And to where now it's like where I'm at now, like I try to teach it now. It's so hard for me to go back to what it was, you know, and I had no knowledge. Um, but I did have a natural sales ability. Like I was like the top selling associate at Ritz Camera all across the county or like my district or whatever. And um, But I was just kind of the nice guy that was easy for all the customers to come to. So it wasn't like just pure sales. It was just, you know, compared to my coworkers, I was the, you know, people had great people gravitated towards. But um What's the cheat code for it though? Like if you, I'm, I know you've probably hired a bunch of business development people over your really distinguished career. Like what do you look for in someone that you think, you know what, they've got the the makings of what could be someone who's great at sales and business development. It's so different for whatever they're selling. Like you could be, if you're selling, you know, commoditized widgets, like you have to be ruthless. You just have to like be fearless in terms of opening up as many doors as possible. And so that's a completely different personality than like long form enterprise sales where it's relationship building. And there are, uh, for me personally, I, I like to, my model is how do I get people to come to me? So how can I create content? How can I become like a authority in the space? How can I, you know, build my brand so people naturally come towards me and have inbound as opposed to like going out and finding it outbound. So all those have completely different skill sets required and different personalities. Um, and I've dabbled in all of them. Um, I all uh, pretty much my skill is driving inbound, bringing in the inbound. That's what I gravitate towards when it comes to hiring and finding that G code. I just, people that are genuinely curious are people that I tend to gravitate towards hiring. Uh, it depends on the role ultimately, but if they have a genuine curiosity of how things work, how to solve things, and they're able to change their perspective on things, that means they can put themselves in the customer's shoes, which I think is such an important aspect of being able to empathize with the customer. What are they actually going through? What are they not going through? What what do they actually care about versus what you want to sell them? Uh -huh. um, and just being able to identify that in an interviewing, interviewing process of like what kind of questions they're asking. If they're not asking questions, game over. Yeah, you know, they're just projecting, projecting, projecting. Like they're gonna, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna work with my style. Uh, maybe that works in other ways, but uh, not with me. Uh, so I look for people that have very inquisitive questions. They did some homework. Uh, they, you know, show some curiosity towards understanding the reasons why. Uh, I think those are incredible attributes to have, especially at early age. And like one thing that my, I guess actually my cheat code, being in college and knowing that you can ask dumb questions and you get a free pass. And people are much more likely to help a student than someone early in their career. So I kind of jump started my career development in college when I had that free pass. And I didn't realize I had that free press until probably later on. So anyone ever meet that's still in college, I'm like, you have to just reach out to people that are more successful than you, people that you think could be interesting uh, and start building those relationships. Even if it's just a one-time meeting, like you can extract so much knowledge as a nascent college student. Uh, and people are so much more willing to give that time to you for free as a way to give it back. Uh, then, hey, I'm looking for a job. I'm out of college. Everyone's like, ah, I don't want to deal with you. But if you're in college, you're like, oh yeah, like, oh, here's my stories, you know, it's all that stuff. So it's a way to get access to people and build relationships when there's not really as big of a barrier. Awesome. Um, so that's, I would say probably the best thing I did early in my career. Love it. Thanks so much for that. I think the biggest issue with sales is that people often, it, it, for me, it's always one of two roadblocks. It's either you're afraid to ask questions Right, people are afraid of answers. They're afraid to ask the questions. How much money do you have? How much money do you want to spend? What are you looking for? You know, what's going to stop you from buying this? All the qualifiers and what and so on and so forth. I think the other thing that people get into is that 
they have been exposed to or through the movies, through through experiences or what have you, a, to your point, a commoditized sales approach, which is uh, a bit cold and careless versus I think with you, you love had a love for cameras, you sat in Ritz camera and you sold something, which means that you were you you likely were consultative selling, right? So you were tell you were teaching people and selling them, so they trusted you. So you were trust building, relationship building, even though it's a small window, it's not enterprise, you know, yeah. six, eight, eight, ten months in the sales cycle. And then when you go to SEO, I cut my teeth in SEO as well uh, in two thousand two. Most people don't know what those things were, right? SEO, PPC, keyword yeah. research, and so on and so forth. So you often fall back into the consultative role, which is teaching them, building trust, and then selling them. And I think that once you start to see the difference between this sort of ice cold, I transactional, it's just me and you for this dance, real quick, and then I'm off to the next one versus we're going to be together for a while. You're going to keep buying lenses. I'm going to teach you. You might come to my classes. I think it's a big difference. I think that that's the that's the thing that hurts most people when they say I can't do sales or I'm not happy with sales. Yeah, no, I love that. But what, what, where was it that the the thing clicked and you said, you know what, it's time for me to really step out of the role of the photographer and step into the role of the business person enabling photographers? Because I, we talked about that a little bit before the cameras turned out in terms of like when that switch flipped. I asked him. Um, when was the last time he picked up a camera? Um, he's got a, a two-year-old uh, like I do, so not a lot of time for going up, going up to the attic and getting the expensive gear out. Just pull the iPhone out; it's quicker and easier. But and um, better in the long run. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. Um, but talk to us about that that switch flip where you're like, you know, I got this domain, I'm learning internet marketing, I'm learning about inbound. Now it's time to really turn this thing into a business. It was honestly like that mindset was like day one of like I wanted this to be like it was well, I guess. Actually, no, I would say when I first started the business, it was, I'm curious, I'm going to learn. This is giving me an avenue to learn. It wasn't a, meant to be a real business. When it became a real business was when I started the San Diego photography classes. Because I was like taking photos, but I'd never saw that as like my career or my like life. But when I saw the opportunity for this giant gap, because I, I was also, I was 21, 22 when I conceptualized this. And I wanted to learn how to take better photos. And I'm like, well, I could go to school which no not happening or i can take this like super expensive course that who knows if it's worth my time or not uh so i i had the need and then um in that you know session with my buddy where he's doing like google adwords research and stuff and i saw that opportunity that's probably when it clicked was like this is a real opportunity because also like photography it's like you have to have a network you have to build relationships like inbounds kind of like wasn't as big back then it wasn't as competitive as it is now on the inbound so um, I would say it's probably that moment in my friend's session that I kind of like saw the, you know, kind of the inkling of a real business. And so, yeah, I bought the domain, set up a meetups website or like a meetups <laughs> group uh, first. So before I built a full website or anything um, and cross marketed on meetup. And from there, I set up a class one month out and photography 101, 10 bucks. Just like, and I set up photo 102 just because I knew if I had, if I got people to come to the first one, I want to make sure I have something to sell them for the second one. Uh, so I didn't even know what 101 or 102 was going to be. This is pre chat GPT, so you couldn't just like, <laughs> you know, make it up. I had to like, I think I spent at least 30 hours like coming up with that curriculum for a two hour class and just like, I can't screw this up. It's also like, I'm who am I to teach people photography? I was the guy looking for the teacher. So it's a little of the imposter syndrome. Um, but I just kind of put it together. I had seven people. Eight people show up for that first class. Complete randos. No, I, did. I didn't do any like promotion in my network. This was all from Meetup coming in. Um, but within a week or two, I was already ranking on Google and my group or my Meetup group started growing like crazy. Um, the first couple classes were home runs. Everyone loved them, got amazing feedback. Um, and it was just really nice to kind of see that validation. And I used that as a means to like scale up the you know, investment into the business. And I was fortunate enough to have my marketing agency allow me to use the conference room on the weekends mm. to do the classes, uh, which is great. And they just thought, oh, Jason's doing some cute side project. That's adorable. Like that was kind of like the attitude. Uh, and it was about a year later, um, I was out of college. I just graduated. I've been doing it for a couple of months. Uh, I actually met my wife through my classes, which is kind of always a fun story. Uh, she showed up to one of my classes after I was doing some travel and stuff like that about like six months after I graduated. 
Um, and yeah, that's really why you did it. <laughs> I, uh, you know, in fairness, I had, you know, amazing, attractive people in my classes all the time, but I was like, wow, what's that one star review on Yelp going to be? Like, if I ever did something, I was like, I'll never, ever, uh, interact in that kind of way. I just feel like there's a professional barrier that can never be crossed. Lunch to lose. Um, it was a unique case with my wife though. She, uh, she was a friend of a friend that I did not know. And we found out we had that mutual friend. So then we saw each other outside the classroom and that kind of connected us. There was no, you know, flirting of any kind in the classrooms, but um, I was very strict about that. I was like, "This is my business. I cannot screw this up." <laughs> um, so, yeah, I ended up uh, taking that to the next level. I, I invested into, you know, really growing the business. I created. I ended up getting to about like twelve courses. We ended up getting to about uh, five thousand students um, uh, that like registered and like were on our newsletter, come to our classes. Had all kinds of curriculum and courses, hired a bunch of other instructors, uh, made it like a real business and gave my opportunity to travel the world. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to take off two weeks and uh, go to Europe or, you know, South America or whatever. Uh, kind of before digital nomads were cool. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what if I happened to meet up? Did Eventbrite buy it? <clears throat> uh, well, WeWork bought it. We work bought meetup yeah. and then just right and then to the spun off. I think, I think it was, I think it was WeWork that bought them. Yeah. No, you're right. Actually, I, I, I remember that now. Um, yeah, we were. We, it's like a flashback talking to you between because I, I come from an SEO background, yeah. so like Meetup was a great. Meet, yeah, Meetup was a great tool. Uh, when you said uh, it wasn't as competitive, all I could think about was those the days. <laughs> yes, but we, yeah. we we used to do all kinds of crazy shows so, with search algorithms. No, we really did. Um, I, I've got a, There's a lot of people now where they're trying to do the courses and the coaching and, and basically the stuff that you have. You know, been there, done that. We're now we're talking about what 2011, 2012. Yeah, this is 2010, 2011. Yeah. yeah, um, you've done a lot with courses and course where a lot of folks now are trying to monetize their mm -hmm. knowledge. Any tips that you can give to the first time founder or the entrepreneur on if you were starting courses today in the crowded market that we're in, in the TikTokification of the world, what are some things that you would suggest doing that could really help with? acquiring customers and scaling, assuming that they've got a good curriculum down and all that, you know, go from there. Yeah, you got to have good content. Um, I think the trick of that, uh, nowadays is being an influencer. Like, you know, as... You How do you do that? Personal that brand, like, you have to put yourself out there. Um, and I've done it in three industries. So, like, photography, then I did it in gaming, and then I did it uh, now in, like, kind of the venture capital world. Um, so, each time getting bigger and bigger uh, as I do it. But those cro those audiences don't cross communicate, so that was always a challenge, like giving up that audience to then go set, start from scratch. Um, persistence of constantly trying to create content on a regular basis, um, giving away everything for free all the time. You know, giving away your advice, giving away your time, giving away your um, you know connections and stuff. So just trying to add value to those around you, so that when you do make that ask of follow me, subscribe, comment, whatever. Um, or download my course. Um, there's less friction because you've given you've given so much upfront value, right? Uh, and there's just so much content now that tells people exactly play by play of exactly what to do, and you know, like. Um, but I think it's a matter of finding what your comfort zone is because if you're going to commit to something, so that was like the decision for me uh, with my new company. Of uh, I want to be in the world of private equity and venture capital. That's where I want to be. Like I can have conversations with people for hours in this space and it's has the, the, the TAM or the accessibility to capital is absolutely massive. So it's like, this has enough to kind of fuel me moving on. Uh, so that's why I kind of jumped into creating content, podcasts, all kind of stuff in this space, because, um, this is something I could retire in and be happy. Uh, cause it has a lot of flexibility kind of to dabble into different businesses. So I say like, to answer your question, like be passionate about the topic. And then you don't have to be the expert day one, but that's the beauty of like what I was saying, like I wasn't the expert in the photography or all I was 22, like what kind of experience do I have really to share? Um, but I just outcompeted anyone else offering the content. I just, you know, went and learned and spent hours and hours and hours, not just on sharing my experience, like actually creating technical learning material taught myself but then I use that to teach others to which made me smarter in the topic because then you hear questions and variables that you then have to learn and you know, adapt to and stuff uh, so again it's like putting yourself out there being committed to 
the task and being passionate about the topic. Uh, and then, you know, following the playbooks. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of playbooks out there. I don't have to recite, but you know, just go out there and just do those steps. And it's, as long as it's what you truly want to do, uh, you know, it'll steadily grow. I think the, the lesson there for those listening to this is focus on giving value to your audience and understanding the problems that, that they need to have solved mm-hmm. and really getting, walking a, a mile in their shoes essentially. And understand that you're going to have to give a lot and give and give and give. And that's going to build the know you, like you, trust you. And then they'll buy from you. Yeah. Um, don't expect to just you know turn on the camera or turn on the platform on day one and expect to be driving sales. You got to build an audience and you got to build a community. So did, did I nail that right? Yeah. And that's I think that's the most important thing these days is build an audience. Like it creates the most versatility for a founder or a content creator, whatever it is. Like if you don't have someone that you, you know, an audience to present to like creating it from scratch you can do it but you gotta spend a lot of money you're gonna be paying for ads you gotta like kind of pay to get that attention where you can grow it organically over time and have stronger brand recognition and notoriety in your niche that's awesome and speaking of notoriety um so you're building that business you're scaling that business and at that time one of the biggest players in the space kodak shows up um talk us through that process because you know the audience just peaked up. They got all excited thinking that I'm going to say that you sold the Kodak, but there's a twist <laughs> to this story. So stick around. Well, so, well, actually Kodak didn't show up until Tongali, right? To get, uh, Togali, yeah. Togali. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Togali. Okay. Togali. It was a mistake that happened so, all the time. Because you, you stepped away from the classes business. Mm-hmm. Into the marketplace. And yeah. Into the marketplace. I thought we were sort of flowing into the marketplace. Yeah. So yeah. you did the marketplace business. Before we get into that, I just want to say how, when I was reading the show notes, uh, how aligned our worlds are. I don't know if you know that. Um, Pete and I actually, the way we, our agency got famous was because we got to work with Lady Gaga and how we got to work with Lady Gaga was because we built an online marketplace for creative people to find locations. Basically, we figured out, we said location scouting was not a marketplace. We built an app for record orders, essentially. Yeah. And then had the San Antonio Film Commission was using it for... Yeah, they started loading it up. We got like 36,000 followers and interestingly, didn't chase Kodak because Kodak was already like on the the desk. We chased Canon uh, and and struck out pretty badly with them and couldn't figure out how to exit this business. We knew that there was a good use case, Um, but we were... It's it's very similar. SEO, the creative world took us Mm -hmm. to to making this product for the Reckies and then all of a sudden... uh, we again, it, it turned out to be good because uh, Gaga's team liked it and ultimately worked with us on some other stuff, and that gave us, uh, you know, some some really interesting opportunities. But ultimately, this twist of, of from where you were to to where you're going uh, gets really interesting. And I was like, this guy is like in, in my, <laughs> is in our lives. Yeah, it's it's funny too. I mean, like I was just reliving that in my head when you said that the idea that we we pitched Gaga's team was essentially let's do a crowdsourced music video contest mm. and have all these record artists kind of build you the coolest place to launch your next video. Um, and what's funny is one of the Super Bowl commercials literally just yesterday was talking about Beyonce breaking the internet. The whole concept, the whole idea was based on will the thing that she does break the internet? It was a Verizon commercial, obviously. Yeah. So Verizon's like, our network's the best, right? Yeah. So pretty great strategy, folks. Um, <laughs> but putting that aside for a second, Gaga's team was like, no, we can't do this with you. We love the idea. But everything that Gaga launches on the internet will melt the internet. So we just can't, we can't do that. At the time S3 was big and Amazon and all that. They're like, no, but we really like you guys and we really want to do something with you. And then ultimately- Well, she had just yeah, melted Amazon. She just melted Amazon servers. Yeah. yeah. Um, S3 for, for her like download thing. But it was, it was super inspiring to see that sort of like, so thanks for, I don't often get to relive yeah. those moments on these shows, <laughs> but like David said, we have a very, very similar thing. And now you're in VC and venture capital and he's raising a bunch of venture capital. So it's like- very kindred spirits, and that was not a plan or a plan. So yeah, thank exactly. you for that. that. Never, never could have foreseen where I am today from five years ago, let alone 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, actually, that we were talking about that. I thought we were sort of already in the marketplace side, but that's a really good po- point. So just for the audience, can you just talk a little bit about, like, how was Toggly, you know, fundamentally different from from the first business? Because I think I started to fuse them together. So Dave, thanks for that. Yeah, I know. So... I had the photography classes going well. The photography business was doing well. I, you know, have real income. I'm traveling the world. I had a lot of fun. But, you know, as we're talking about offline, just like it got repetitive very quickly. And I was like, how can I do something bigger? I never saw myself again as being labeled as a photographer. I want to build businesses. 
And I came up with this idea of like a marketplace to connect photographers and consumers. And I went to try to get funding uh, for the idea. I didn't have, I haven't built anything, just, you know, have the network, I have a community. And it's like, and I know how to build websites, like I'll figure it out. So I went to the camera store owner, which was my biggest sponsor who like funded a bunch of stuff we did. And I was like, Hey, I got this idea. And he's like, stop right there. You need to go talk to this other guy, John. And I'm like, who's this John guy? Like, this is my idea. Like back out, you know, back up. Uh, and supposedly my friend John, or well, who became my friend, uh, this guy, John, he, um, had conceptualized the exact same idea. He already raised some money for it. And he was like kind of getting the pieces together for it. And so we had met and we just instantly clicked. Like once I kind of like, I was very like, well, so you step it on my turf, you know, cause he had no photography background at all. Uh, so he needed someone like me to come in and legitimize it. And, uh, he actually ended up getting the money from the camera store owner, um, before I even got into the picture. So I was like, all right, like there's some alignment here. So we basically wanted to create this concept of streamlining the photography booking process. Cause every photographer has, you know, to put it bluntly, has an ego and they have like their pricing strategy. Like they just keep market up pricing and everything's priced differently. And for like just an average consumer who just wants like to have more frequency of documentation of their lives and more photos and stuff like that with a professional uh, personal. Uh, so we decided to come out with fixed pricing in the marketplace. And yeah, I was like, you know, the cheapest thing was like a hundred bucks or something to get some like headshots and you know exactly what you're going to get uploaded to the platform. So we built this platform. I was running my business from nine to five. I'd go home, eat with my wife until about eight o'clock. And then we'd go back to my studio and work till like two in the morning, like at least three, four days a week. Um, so we started building this up, scaling it. Um, and we were so dead set on raising capital because this is, you know, when fun, you know, VC starts to become a little bit more mainstream, sort of, not really in San Diego, unfortunately. And that's ultimately why we didn't end up having the outcome we wanted. But um, so we built up the marketplace, got to thousands of drivers, thousands of transactions, we're doing like 40 grand a month in revenue, and we cannot raise money for the life of us. We were just like out hustling. We're going all up and down the coast. But, you know, hindsight, talked to all the wrong people but didn't know any better because there was not really any content about that stuff back then. Uh, Heads were your podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fundraising comes in, which- uh-huh, moment Yeah, for the later yeah. on in life. Yeah. Pop that in the show notes. He's got a great podcast. Yeah. So um, so I was just like struggling to know kind of what to do as a first time. Yeah, I would consider that more of a first time founder. It was the real one. That was the real business. Like I was running a small skill-based business before and this was like actually meant to be a real business. So we ended up raising like a couple hundred K and um, angel investor, uh, from angel investors- um, and we kept growing, growing, growing. We were like, we're hitting like, if, if we were to take the metrics we had back then today, you know, the Sand Hill Road, it yeah, good. it would have been a no brainer raise at least like a million, two million on like a 10, $15 million valuation. We were trying to raise a million on three, you know, like now nah, it's like laughable to think about, but, um, it's also something I'm using to kind of reconcile a lot of founders I work with now. Like, Hey, what we saw the last couple of years ago is not real. <laughs> what? What well, was before is actually, you know, more realistic in terms of what valuations were. But, um, so yeah, we, we had a good business. I was burning out. I was burning candles at both ends, kind of try to keep my main source of income alive while going, you know, all in on this business. How do you know when you're burning out? I get that question a lot. I've had people email me recently and saying, how do you know when you are burning out? Not when you've burned out, but what are the signals of burnout? I would say I started doubting myself. I would say that was probably like, you know, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? So fear, doubt, yeah. starting to peak up a little bit. Yeah, that started peaking a lot just because we were so discouraged because we spent so much of our time trying to sell investors that we, you know, we should have been prioritizing customers. Mm. And I'll be able to growing, how much faster could we have grown? How much could we have tweaked the business model? Like, so like Captain Hindsight going back, I'd be like, screw the venture capital. We should have just built a real business. Right. And we probably could have done it. But you probably weren't sleeping a whole lot back then. You said you were working oh, yeah. two in the morning, at all. trying to balance a, a new wife at the time or yeah. relationship. Um, but you, oh, yeah, she did not like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she was a- uh, They never do. Yeah. She was kind, sweet, and caring as best she could be yeah. <laughs> to put up with me. And, my, like, and the joke was, John was my other wife, you know, my you know, my work wife. Uh, and so, yeah, exactly. Yep. And so we- you know, we're grinding, uh, you know, late night, every night. Because also our dev team was in the Philippines, or Nepal. So the only time we could really get, make real progress was more working with them real time. Right. Um, and so that was a struggle. So yeah, I think uh, it was fear and doubt started popping up. You know, the failure to raise money. 
and just kind of getting basically scammed by some angel groups, you know, to pay to play. Like, oh, this is the only way you can get in. You got to pay us this. And then you got to go travel. Up there. We spent all this money doing that. I was like, man, if we just threw that into ads, <laughs> we probably could have had way better performance and gotten profitable. Uh, so Rule yeah. Number one, don't pay someone to raise money for you. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Naive me. I had no idea. And our lead investor who was like this angel investor who was like our, you know, board member, he was a part of one of the groups and he's like, oh yeah, like, yeah, it's great. We see all these amazing companies. He encouraged it. And then after the fact, he's like, once he saw the inner workings of it from our side, he's like, I left, he left the group. Yeah. This this is a scam. Sorry guys. (laughs) Um, and so at least for companies like us, like if you're, there's like real estate deals, that kind of stuff was different, but for, for us, it was dumb to do it. But you fought this out for five years. No, 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 no. This was 2000, end of 2012 was when we conceptualized it. And then, um, it concluded at the end of 2015. Okay. So three um, years. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That was about two, 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 two and a half. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun and, you know, we had a good time. We really started getting penetration. Customers loved us. Photographers loved us. We had a, and like building community, building a following. Like that was my job. It's like constantly being entertaining the community. Uh, gave free classes away, gave my stuff away for free to like get them in. Um, so we had like 3000 photographers, uh, nationwide, mostly concentrated in California. Uh, and then, yeah, thousands of transactions, I think at some point. Uh, this was early too. I mean, people are going to hear this now going, well, I roll marketplace, but like, you know, t- between 2012 and 2015, like marketplace was a very unique concept. You know, we didn't have the Kajabi world we're in today and the, you know, the teachables and all these like, you know, Patreon and I mean, there's a million Gumroad, et cetera. Like well, all these platforms now that make it easy, it wasn't easy back then. Yeah. You had to do a lot of this stuff. You had a you know, bootstrap an engineering team in Nepal or wherever you could afford it, right? <laughs> to get it all kind of stringed together. So that's that's a interesting note for the audience too, is like the the timeliness of the concept as well. And I think one of our biggest drawbacks was the fact that we had an overseas team and um when it came to fundraising, one of the biggest deterrents was not yeah. having like a CTO. Like I could I could have built it in WordPress, but it would have taken ten times longer and been messy. Not scalable. No technical co founder. That was a huge drawback. Yeah, I think that was one of the big deterrents. And also, we were in San Diego. There was no capital in San Diego back then. Yeah. Um, so that was the other kind of deterrent. We had a bunch of people saying, "Hey, like, come join us in Accelerator. Move to LA for you know six months, or yeah. you know, move to San Francisco, move to Seattle." And we're like, "Well, did we get the money first? Like, because <laughs> my that's a big commitment. <laughs> yeah, that's expensive. I'm damn yeah, exactly. <laughs> My my hot take on the second co founder thing. This comes up a lot on on this show. If you can, if you're probably not surprised by it, but. It's like if you're building a factory, you need to have someone on the founding team that knows how to build factories, right? So if you're building a technical product, yes, you need a technical co-founder. Um, depending on what you're launching, you know, nowadays, low code, no code, I don't think it's as prevalent if you're not building a tech product, right? If you're building a tech product and you don't have a technical co-founder, um, that would be kind of like launching a business for photographers and not having any photographers on the team, exactly. right? You, you might want to invest in one of those. So I think it's all context. I um, just want the audience to have that because I think that's been coming up a lot more lately. And I think the world has shifted quite a bit now, you know, we're recording this in 2024 where, you know, we've got all these LLMs, we've got all yeah. these tools we can jump on and, you know, ask YouTube, ask ChatGPT, or ask whatever you want to ask um, and make things a little bit easier. But naturally, I think context is everything. So you didn't have that and yeah. it made it more difficult for you. But really this business, if I'm hearing it correctly, because you couldn't raise funding, it was the mindset of a bootstrapper in terms of how you bootstrap, how you- Well, that's how I sh- we should have had a mind- uh, bootstrap mindset. But you did. We, we did not. We, What's the we like hustled, but we we were so, we spent all our time trying to raise money. Okay. And if, like I said, if we just focus on bootstrapping and just taking that initial capital that we got and extending that as much as possible as opposed and getting to cash flow positive, probably would have been a fine, you know, good business. Also, we weren't venture backable. Now, again, hindsight, it wasn't a venture backable business. Like we weren't going to be a billion dollar outcome. Right. And we did not know that. And we like could not see that perspective interesting like we could be worth like hundreds of millions like you know like reality it would have been like a good 10 million dollar year business but no investor wants to invest in you know not not a vc not the people we were talking to and that was a perception that uh i didn't have at the time that you know looking back i would have definitely reflected on and be like all right if we're gonna go down this business bootstrap it Uh, which is again a common theme these days um and founders i'm dealing with of like that were venture mindset that you know, either tried pitching and saw how that's not going well, or they've completely erased that from their agenda until they get to some kind of validation or scale. Uh, which again, you could be non-technical co-founding teams and build products if it generates revenue, 
that's your validation that you don't need a CTO or a co-founder right. that's uh, technical. The proof is in the profits. Exactly. That's the valley. That's the valley's doing. Everybody wants it to run and be a unicorn. It's like the big dream. But I mean, this there's nothing wrong with a ten million dollar a year MR, you know, ARR business. Right. You know, it's a fantastic, great business. Yeah, yeah, it's a great personal business. It's not. I wouldn't even consider it a lifestyle business. That is a, it's business. a real business. That is a real business. And I think that everybody just ran after the shiny. Uh, and uh, well, there's just so much. I deal with this with founders all the time. Kind of coming to me like, you know, like I need venture capital for validation, like for your personal. For customers, like, why do you need it for validation? Like, because it, it, you know, it is a sense of validation. You get all the press, you get to brag, and all that stuff. But you know, does it really enable you to do your business? Can you do it without, or can you go raise a little bit of like angel money uh, and get just as far and build a great business and not have the stress of being a failure because you raised venture but you didn't have a venture outcome? Yeah, you know? I, I'd usually tell those people you can go to a private airport and take a picture in front of a private jet. It doesn't mean that you can afford to be on the private jet. So yeah. val- watch out for validation because it's like not to me- a killer. Yeah. Not to mention, you can get the wrong VC and they can yeah. have dumb money it, for smart money. Well, it could have a detrimental effect on your cap table. Or too smart money. Yeah, but, yeah exactly. You know, yeah. Predatory terms. So so after two-ish years, you have a pretty big pitfall because you wound up in an acquisition talks with Kodak yep. for this business. So tell us, how did how did the acquisition happen? So Or how did the talks for the acquisition happen? So a good friend of mine um, and a consultant uh, for Toggly was a contract CMO for Kodak. Uh, so she was kind of leading a lot of their you know, marketing initiatives and decisions. This is after, I think, coming out of bankruptcy or going, I can't remember when exactly it was, but uh, the bankruptcy was, I think they came out of it. Uh, and it was like very lean team, all IP based. And we kind of pitched her the concept of how you could use, you know, this could be either toggly by Kodak or just Kodak. And, uh, you know, this is how you get into back of the home to everyone. And they loved the concept. Everything was great. Um, we met with the CEO. We met with the, you know, the leadership team. Everything was going really well for about two months. And we were trying to get like a couple million on it. Just, you know, we were trying to raise on a $3 million valuation. Let's see if we can get a $3 million valuation on it. Uh, basically, we got to the point where they started doing real deep dive. But again, a mistake we made was we didn't kind of come to terms first but before we're doing the deep dive. And once they kind of got in the deep dive and they saw that they were trying to do an aqua hire was kind of how they were seeing it to try to acquire the tech talent as well. And when they saw that they were abroad, that kind of like slow rolled the conversation. They were like, oh, like, well, we really liked everything we were seeing, but we kind of want the talent to be in house and the talent didn't build a team product. And then they had a huge, uh, another wave of like bad press come about them. And we just kind of got forgotten. You know, mm-hmm. we were like pushy. We kept trying and just like falling on deaf ears. Uh, so what I'm hearing there, and we heard this recently as well, is get it in writing in terms of yeah. deal terms before you fully open the Komodo and go exactly. through the, you know, the anal probe experience. Yeah. And it, you know, helped us for later acquisitions and discussions and stuff like that. But, uh, that lesson was you know, definitely a painful one because that would have been awesome. We would have moved to, I think we were, we were supposed to move to Mo- Rochester and actually work out of the Kodak office, which was going to be nuts for us to consider coming from our San Diego cozy, you know, I know. You're, <laughs> going, <laughs> you're literally going from like the 72 best to like to like your ass off the yeah. worst. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, and then you decided to just wind it down after that. Yeah. So that fell through. We ran out of money. I was so burnt out. I needed to get out of San Diego. I was just like, I need something fresh. I need something new. And I was just so like burnt on the photography world and just like going all in on that. I just wanted to look at something fresh. And I had a friend out in New York that, you know, offered me like a contract role to kind of work with him on um, what he was doing. And I was like, moved to New York City. My wife hated San Diego. She was a big city girl and she's like, I want to be in a big city. And she always wanted to move to New York. We've traveled a few times. And so it was kind of a no brainer. So I'm like, all right, let's uproot our lives and, and go. And so within like a month, well, like, it's either, it either move and give her what you want and happy wife, happy life, or maybe you still be in San Diego, but just not with that way. <laughs> so that's yeah. no brainer, but yeah. that's why I was no brainer. Uh, yeah, very happy with my wife. Um, so basically like within the act, conceptualization of moving to New York, that opportunity kind of like being in the horizon. I was like, all right, how do I liquidate everything? Like, how do I sell my business? Like, cause it, this thing's worth something. It's like, I could just shut it down, but it's like, can I get something for it? And, um, I didn't run like a formal process. I just basically went to my employees and was like, look, 
how about you guys take this over and you give me, you know, a certain amount of cash flow for the remainder of, you know, time periods, like three years. Um, and they were like, wait, so we get to keep all the profit? It's like, yeah, as long as you make this payment, the rest is yours. And the sales engine, the marketing engine, like all the, you know, SEO and everything. So sold it to my employees separately. So one that was on the class side and one was on the photography uh, side. Uh, so that was like a nice outcome, nice little cushion to kind of move and, you know, deal with New York rent. Yeah. Was, uh, was, um, and then the moment I landed in New York, um, the contract that I had signed to come and move there was not what it seemed. It was a little bit of a rip pull. Got there. My friend is no longer my friend. We'll go to the details there. But uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't selling what he was selling. And so I got out of that as quickly as possible. And I'm like, oh, great. Now no income. <laughs> and then New York. Um, you know, from that one gig. So, but what's made about amazing about New York and why I'm now in love with New York is this pace of innovation, just commitment. Like I was able to sign like four clients as like kind of like a mini, mini marketing agency, um, within like a month and I was making double what I was supposed to be making, but I moved in November, everything fell apart without other job in December. And by the end of to January, I was making double what I was supposed to be making. Some fast closes. What was your pitch? I don't really remember, actually. I know how to do uh, inbound. Um, the end. Yeah, <laughs> you know, basically, he's out. Like, my track record of inbound, like, let me help you. And um, and then I got connected to a company called Liquid Sky, which was just a founder with some really cool tech and a bunch of old white dudes from Connecticut that were funding it. And um, I came in uh, to basically be, like, the co-founder and help scale that up. Um, and we ended up, so Liquid Sky was a cloud gaming technology company. So we enabled the ability to play any device. Sounds like a psychedelic drug. So I was like, get this why? Get me on some of that. You know, but yeah, there is, uh, you know, there's definitely some discussions and there was some interesting, uh, user generated content around our brand, um, similar to that, uh, that sentiment. But we, so basically I came in, it was just me and the, you know, uh, the other guy Ian at this point and working at his parents' house. Just see like, the hacker in the basement. Yeah, he's the hacker in the basement. Super smart guy. Uh, oh, eh. well, I won't go to that. But uh, so yeah, he's a super smart guy. Definitely like te- technical nerdy guy. But um, I just jived with him quite well in terms of like knowing what he was trying to achieve and then helping him, you know, do that. Um, and she were the the Cheryl Sandberg for Zuck in that scenario. If Cheryl Sandberg was working out of the. The, that hacker house, yes. <laughs> I don't think Sherry Sandberg, Sandberg would have come into those early days um, before it was a billion dollar company. But yeah, essentially just coming in and writing the ship and just aligning what he had envisioned, but actually bringing it to reality. Uh, and so we helped, or I, you know, we basically took that company from nothing to raising about 12 million, getting to about a million and a half users. Um, and then I can kind of show the details, like getting an acquisition offer from our biggest investor, which was Samsung. Um, and uh, that was, uh, uh, yeah, like, I don't know how detailed you want me to get, but that was a wild ride. No, let's so, do it. So, let's, yeah. so, yeah. so, so, so let, me, let, me, let me slow you down. Let me pace this, because this is a great conversation, right? So you've had two small businesses. One almost gets acquired and it falls apart. You then go to New York, you do a couple hustles, and you wind up in a new company. Yeah. You raise $12 million. Tell me, let's start right there. How did you, what, what, what were you selling and what was the, and, and what part of the fundraise was on your, on, on your plate? So when we first got there or I, when I like started working out of that, that, uh, you know, Ian's house and like started conceptualizing what we're going to do, I saw the opportunity really for like, we need customers because this tech is incredibly expensive, incredibly complex. And we were going to be releasing this new version of it to make it more stable. Um, and so kind of the, his board essentially, uh, or the board basically brought in like about a million for me, like tons of angels. I think it was like 40 or 50 angels. It was, it was a nasty cap table. Um, and I helped kind of secure some of that money once I got in. Um, but I wasn't too involved in that first, uh, capital raise of like those 900 K a million, whatever it was. He was that early and had a board. That's the thing is he, if he went, he had the idea and he went to uh his neighbor like wealthy neighbor and he like ma and yeah <laughs> yeah i know no, that was good sorry i didn't watch the whole thing but it was, that was one we're filming this the day after the super bowl and the commercial 
That was um, one of the better ones. That was definitely a good a good commercial. That we're talking about the Arnold Schwarzenegger neighbor State, State Farm commercial. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, and you guys were launching like a almost like a Parsec competitor, right? Like Lily. Oh yeah, you know guys? the Parsec guys. He knows uh, everything. I, I know a thing or two, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know them uh, pretty well. Yeah, so um, we use Parsec for Parsec. If it wasn't for Parsec during COVID, we'd be screwed. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. Yeah, they they want to completely for, like, route that for three D for animation, yeah. be able to connect to the machines and like low latency that sort of thing. It's yeah, the it, changer. Benji was a smart guy, um, but that that's a separate conversation. But yeah, so we we could centralize very similar, basically remote desktop. Yep. Um, but we had, for gaming. Yeah, and we had done something that was pretty fascinating in terms of splitting GPU compute uh, in the cloud. So previously, you'd only be able to like put all the compute power into one thing but we were basically virtualizing the gpu and can be able to split up the resources so that allowed a higher density of uh, peak utilization on a server than say you know any other solution out there uh, so we brought down the cost to compute substantially and we created all these really cool technological layers of, in terms of we had all these fun names from like SkyStack as our virtual orchestration layer and you know the vmware for gamers yeah and uh, so it was a lot of fun. And then basically I came in to kind of, all right, let's get, con- let's get validation. Let's get consu- uh, customers so that we can go out and raise money. Uh, so we really try to we build a Reddit community and started getting a lot of like initial users from there. And that became viral uh, just because gamers find a solution to play any game on any device, uh, you know, play, you know, keep, you know, playing, you know, whatever World of Warcraft or League of Legends on your computer. And then you got to go to the bathroom and you keep playing, you know, <laughs> uh, that was something that really took off. And so we had a lot of viral components and our whole job was basically to nurture the community. And then we started scaling and ramping up, hiring people. Uh, and then shortly after, you know, kind of moving out of the base, you know, the parents' house and into like a proper office down uh, in Manhattan, we uh, started hiring people, got a WeWork, and uh, we raised about $4 million in the first round um, with, uh, and kind of serendipitously, how we got our lead investor Samsung, kind of a fun story. We um, we were we were shopping the deal, just like to your kind of more traditional VC firms weren't getting much interest, just because I know the cash burn this is going to take. You know, to build a GPU cloud, it's got that be, time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we're getting turned down, turned down, and then um, we had to film a commercial. So I wanted to like, you know, create some content, you know, using my photography background. We didn't raise the money yet, so I'm doing it myself. Um, I had a Samsung phone. No, no. Samsung no? Uh, that would have been really good. Yeah, no, that would have been good. Uh, but that was before Samsung, so. Um, but yeah, we ended up, I, I asked uh, uh, my board to connect me to some like, you know, like who are some young kids that are like 15 to 21 that we can film? Uh, you know, let's get some diversity in here. And uh, being, you know, Connecticut area, like the wealthy neighborhoods, there's not a lot of diversity. So my guy was really struggling to find, you know, find someone. We finally found a family. It was awesome. They were amazing. It was like twins. Um, and it just so happened the mother of those kids knew the head of Samsung Next. And she, you know, they went to Harvard together and she was just like, she just kind of happened to run into him. I was like, hey, yeah, my son was in this like commercial for this really cool tech that enables like, you know, playing devices, you know, games on any device. And she showed him the video and he's, they, he requested a meeting. Um, and so we ended up lending him as an investor, which was, uh, or lending Samsung Next as an investor, which gave us a lot of validation, gave us kind of this big behemoth, you know, as a name to drop, uh, which is awesome. And then we shortly raised again. Did you have to go to Korea for the meeting? No, no, no. If okay. that, if that's- Because ser- that Samsung Next was kind of like their US. Right, okay, focus, got it. Yeah. If that serendipitous thing moment did not happen, what would have happened to that round in your opinion? I think we would have been able to raise it. I think the tech that we had built kind of really spoke for itself. We just didn't run like a formal process at the time because we still had money. Um, so we had like a little bit of runway. We were just kind of starting conversations and we were just kind of staying. We weren't focused on talking to the right people. We were focused on just talking to people that had money. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of the big mistakes that we made and probably could have run a more competitive process, but we were pretty happy with the terms. So we didn't argue with Samsung. Um, so let's talk about that for a second, because this is this actually coincides with what you do today in terms of content creation, mm-hmm. which is you talk about uh, fundraising demystified as your podcast, right? Yep. So you've said that twice now. You you know you went up and down the coast in San Diego, up and down the California coast, trying to get money for for your first business or your your second business, I should say, and you failed. 
Um, and now here you are and you did it again. You talked to a bunch of people that just had money yeah. and ultimately you realized that that was a mistake. So, so, so how do you determine who the right, who the right people are, who has the right money, who, who are the right investors in hindsight? Let's talk about it. So hindsight, that's, you know, one of our, you know, so full plug here. Uh, plug away. <laughs> so our platform at Thunder.vc, we're a tech enabled investment bank. We help companies kind of navigate. Um, who they should be talking to, well, more so like their entire capital strategy. So like what's your cap stack, any external capital that you might need, we kind of help figure out is it debt, equity, venture, private equity, you know, high net worth individuals, family offices, and then um, uh, and then help figure out best approach to acquire that capital, who to approach, how to approach them, and then making uh, facilitating those connections. So on our platform, if you're looking for venture, we have a tool where you just give us all your data. So you tell us everything about your company, and then we spit out uh, a result of, compares you against about 6,000, VCs of which only about 3,000 are actively deploying. So we filter out all the people that are, you know, kind of ghost VCs or, you know, kind of a uh, zombie VCs. Uh, so, and then we filter it based on relevancy and create like a whole AI generated match score that identifies the highest probability of uh, investors that are likely to take a meeting with you. How are you getting that information? How do you tell if somebody's actually like a ghost or, or actually deploying? Because I feel like everybody says they're deploying, but they're full of shit. I feel yeah. Busy. So you have to look at the track record. So we run an, um, and scrape a bunch of data that looks at all past investments and the frequency mm -hmm. and velocity of those investments. Like a, like a crunch base yeah. or a pitch book. Yeah. 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 So we basically pull in all that data and then we give a, we create a velocity score. Um, and their velocity score basically means they're not deploying capital in the last like two quarters. We start like deprioritizing them and lower and lower. And if they haven't deployed in a year, we just wipe them out. Uh, oh, wow. Well. They can get back in because, you know, you can raise a fund, you know, at any point in time. So if they start making new investments, we bring it back into the, the loop. But that's why we have 6,500, mm -hmm. you know, VCs in the network in terms of data. Um, but we're only actively scoring against um, 3,000 because those are the 3,000 that have done deals in the last year or so. It's pretty cool. In, in e commerce, we do a thing called RFM a lot, which sounds like a very similar approach to what you're doing on Velocity, which is like frequency, frequency. Uh, recency frequency and monetary value. So you're essentially mm -hmm. putting that into like a velocity score is like, are yeah. they green or are they red? And then from there, red is dead, yeah. green is go. And then that's awesome. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. And then we create a score at a zero out of a hundred. Um, yeah, as a probability score, the likeliness that they took a meeting. So if you go about getting in front of them the right way, so it's one thing to like, all right, now you know who to target. So that's a free tool we give to everyone. Um, so anyone can come and use that and just kind of know like who they should narrow their focus on. And then it's like, all right, now it's an individual strategy for each and every single one of those contacts. Because now you go from like 3,000 VCs that you, like, they have money, I don't want to talk to them. Now, and then you go to like a list of like 40. And like these are the 40 that are actually possibly write you a check. So now it's a matter of, is your business good enough? Do you have the right metrics in your business to be fundable? Uh, and then do you get the right intro that has enough credibility into it, into that VC? Or do you go about getting in front of them in a way that gets their attention? Uh, and so that's, you know, a little more complicated strategy. And that's where we help some clients directly, or we at least like, that's why we have our content, our podcast, like going to help people figure it out themselves. Cause mm. as most founders, especially first time founders are DIYers. Yep. And so we try to help them navigate that. And when they come around and have their second company, then that's when they bring on the help because <laughs> they know better. Very cool. What have you learned in the, in the process of raising capital? Like, uh, recently I learned that nobody actually looks at the deck. It depends. Um, for that comment specifically, if you're coming in cold and you don't have the relationship, yeah, the deck matters. You know, the deck is your shot. That's how you bring some credibility. So you got to build a real, a real business that is attractive. You know, attractive, and you got to be have that message has to resonate with who's uh, ever receiving that deck. But the truth is, they look at that deck for like thirty seconds to two minutes. Yeah, uh, so that's all you get. Um, so you have to make it very clear what you do and avoid and then syndrome, which is where everyone's like, we do this and then we're going to do this yeah. and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. The you problem know? and the solution are like 17 slides. Oh my God. Yeah. And so maybe like, everyone's like, but we're doing such awesome stuff and everyone needs to know what we do. It's like, well, then you're never going to get a shot. Like you have to be just focused on one thing. What's that one thing that is just so clear that I can either as an investor know if it's relevant to me or not. And that's all you're trying to do with like a cold pitch deck. Now, having a deck matters for first time founders, 100%. Like you got to have a deck. You have to go through that process. You have to mentally know kind of what to do and you don't have a track record. Yeah. I always say too, if you can't make a deck, you don't know how to storytell. And if you don't know how to storytell, you don't belong running a business in general. Yeah. So exactly. And um, it's, it's just a good exercise. You know, whether it ends up being the reason you get funded or not, the process of going through 
the deck helps you put yourself in the you know investor shoes, which helps better understand mm-hmm. what's the return potential and whatever. Uh, do you fit the narrative of having the kind of outside returns that they're looking for? Um, and it's, you know, again, targeting who, which investors you talk to is a big part of that in terms of what your end potential is. Um, but yeah, decks, decks matter. Uh, but if you're like a serial founder and you've got, you've got the network and you got the track record. Different, different, different story. Once you, you, can, you can call everybody and be like, Hey, like I'm thinking about doing this. And they're like, I'm in for a hundred K. You know, it's like, I trust you. You're going to, you're going to make money. You're good. He and I just had that conversation a couple of weeks ago. We did. So now going back, so you get Samsung to the table through this serendipitous commercial and moment yep. with Connecticut and its lack of diversity, but the woman, high education, right? Connecticut yep. has great education. That worked out for you. Exactly. Um, and then you raise a total of $4 million. That would become the portion of the, the total of $12 million that you yep. raised. Were you leading these raises? Was the yeah. CEO? Over so it was Ian and I, uh, hand in hand. So I led most of the business mm-hmm. side of it, and he would take care of the tech and the demo and vision. Uh, so I would come in and kind of make sure we were a legitimate business and like had all the boxes checked and everything like that. And then he would hand it over uh, just to kind of like proof of the pudding, like let's see the demo, mm-hmm. which is always like one of the main things that we wanted to do and start with that. Um, and those demos were. We got lucky. <laughs> a lot of those demos, like we were so stressed every time because it was like the technical complexity of what we built was so high and there was just so many moving parts and in some cases it was a black box. And so we're like, please work, please work, please work. But I, you know, credit to Ian, he always knew how to, because how, he, you know, he wrote most of the code himself. Uh, so he knew how to basically guarantee that we wouldn't have any issues. Like we would take over an entire server in our cloud just for him, just so there couldn't be any particular like abuse from a you know, user, which we had happen once or twice. Uh, so yeah, it was. Yeah, if uh, you're selling low latency, you need low latency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we couldn't couldn't take any risk, but it was it was fun. It was a wild ride because the skills I had to learn, like I I designed our hardware servers, like our actual uh, bare metal servers, and like coming from my photography background, like <laughs> just, <laughs> it was a because it was a business problem. And in terms of like how much these servers cost and what's the peak utilization we can get out of them. And I just had to ask a million questions, talk to a bunch of experts because no one really knew how this worked or how it would yeah. work. There's no like, just, get me an A100 and sign up here. It's like, the, 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 yeah. that didn't exist. Uh, like or we were doing P40s, I think it was, on Pascal architecture uh, from NVIDIA. And then we, uh, yeah, one thing I, you know, again, credit to Ian was, um, pitting AMD and NVIDIA against each other all the time, you know, to kind of get the best options. Because uh, that was before AMD really kind of blew up. Yep. Um, great stock to buy. Uh, <laughs> um, I got options July expiration. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, back then it was like, it, it's. I think it's probably like 50 decks or like, you know, 30 X since we, we started talking to AMD. We did like a big launch event with AMD. We ran some stuff on their servers and that pissed off NVIDIA. So that came back to the table and stuff. So it was a lot of that kind of uh, manipulating the giants. So, seven trillion. Seven trillion. Yeah, seven trillion. That's all we need. Seven trillion. Did you see that? Same old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, seven trillion. I literally tweeted that the other day. It's like half my audience had no idea what I meant. And then the other half was like, ah, let's go. It's just so kind of funny. It doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Uh, makes all the sense, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, so you, so now you guys are on fire. You're, you're moving offices. You're. Yeah, we were upgrading offices every like three months in WeWork. And that was the heyday of WeWork. So that was a ton of fun. It was beer on every floor. It was great. And the heart of Times Square. It was tons of fun. Uh, but yeah, we moved, we went from like a five person office to like a 35 person office before we, um, before the Samsung acquisition offer came in. So what did that look like? Out of, out of the blue? Uh, no, it was definitely not out of the blue. It was definitely like something. I was on the writing. I was on the wall. Like what we could do. And everything was demoed on Samsung phones. Were they on your, were they on your board? No, uh, yes. Okay. Um, so I think he was, was he on the board or is this an observer? I can't remember. But he was close. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, okay, so they- they Warren was there. So they knew they knew what you were up to. They were clear on it because- Yeah, we were very, and we were very transparent. We had a great relationship with uh, Gus Warren, who was our VC at uh, Samsung Next. Yeah. Uh, kind of the corporate VCR. Uh, had a really good relationship with him. Everything was great there. Uh, some of the other investors were difficult. They had some family office money in there that w- they were a little bit more- Aggressive. What does that What does that mean? Uh, I'll, I'll get to the I'll, audience. I'll, I'll get to that part okay. after the Samsung deal because that's when the you know that's they, when they got they, aggressive. They the night. 
Uh, so, <clears throat> so basically, we see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, looking, you know, basically two options. We'll go out and raise half a billion to go really build this the proper way. Um, in total, like that's, we would really need it like a half a billion dollars. You need a Sequoia and... Yeah, like get a Sequoia, Z16, whatever, uh, Z16, like or A16Z, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, kind of like that big, big check money. And so we either chase that or we get acquired. And because we need like real capital. And so we were courting, you know, Microsoft, uh, Verizon, uh, Samsung, and a couple others. Uh, throughout the process, and we were all consumer based, so we had about we had about a million and a half users um, before the Samsung acquisition, and it was just we could barely handle the capacity. We had servers all over the globe, and we partnered with IBM, and we had bare metal servers everywhere, and we're having to like negotiate all these like contracts around um, you know bandwidth usage. I'm learning about the dark fiber out of the world, and I'm like, what is this? You know, this is technically over my head, but it was fun to learn. Um, and so Samsung comes in with the offer. Everything's very cordial. Um, it's a long process, as it, you know, as expected to be, but it was going to be an awesome outcome, especially if it's only been three years. You know, to kind of take the company, the the acquisition value was like 15x or 20x, but it, it was three years ago, and to be like liquid and value, you know, like awesome, and then have a arsenal behind us, and basically one of the you know, one of the most popular devices, you know, device manufacturers around the world. Uh, so we were just like, oh, home run, let's do it. So we were very excited about it. <clears throat> there's a lot of like dancing. There's like, there's our first real acquisition. So like Black Duck code reviews and like, oh, we're using open source this. How are you not using it? Like we had to fix all these things, get all these things dialed in. Um, but it was all marching towards a very successful exit. And then our chairman, full disclosure, it was not his favorite, nor was he mine. Um, but uh, he got a little greedy. We had already negotiated terms. Things were looking good, and he wanted more. He retraded. So he basically said, "Like, this is going to be a billion dollar company. You guys are getting us for pennies. Like, let's get back to the table." Because we also were going, you know, going strong on the consumer side. You know, we're lighting money on fire, like it's nobody's business, but growth was there, and uh, we had a good narrative. So that basically added three weeks to the process and got us absolutely nowhere. Keep in mind, this is now going into the holidays. So we were supposed to close before Thanksgiving. And this extended us to basically the first week of December. And what happened in that time was around October, I can't remember exact dates, but this is 2017. Um, he ends up uh, going back to the table, trying to renegotiate. And the CEO of Samsung gets arrested. Like the, I forgot his name. Um, Jay, I think it was. He was the CEO and like the heir to the throne, all that kind of stuff. And he got uh, arrested for fraud or no, uh, it was not fraud. It was um, embezzlement or something with po private politicians or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're like, oh shit, what's going to happen? And then and he had sponsored your deal. He was executive sponsor your deal. Uh, he, he was not really involved. Uh, we never really talked to the main leadership like we talked to a lot of leadership from Korea but never like top brass uh, it was mostly Samsung Next that we were dealing with and Samsung Next running the transaction we we would have been gobbled up by the global org but um, got it uh, but yeah ba basically the new CEO was hired and were you know uh, appointed and brought in and he didn't have any signature authority so the deal was just still merged there I was like ah, it's fine everything's fine everything's gonna be great but because of that delay and the holidays and all that stuff Time he finally close. gets signature authority. So the day we're supposed to close, I think it's like December 8th or something like that, 2017, we had already had buses ordered, champagne on ice, like everything was like ready oh, to go. Oh my we told God. the team, I think it was, we we're going to tell them on Friday, uh, and it was like, I think we, uh, we told the team to be there at like 9 a.m., which is like, we everyone came in at like 10 usually. And we're like, be there at 9, 9 a.m. sharp, we're going to announce everything. And only like, Ian, myself, our CFO, and our board, and one of our product people knew. So the other like 35, 40 people, I have no idea. And uh, so we're like, come to office at nine. We're so excited. Uh, we get a text at like two in the morning that the guy has signature authority and he killed every deal on the table. Oh my God. Every deal. Not just, not had nothing to do with us. Yeah. It just every deal over a million dollars was dead. 
they have to freeze everything to find out how fucked the company is based off of the CEO's yeah. wrongdoings. So that uh, two o'clock in the morning, so you got seven hours before this big meeting. Yeah, well, we, we know we got the text. I didn't, you know, we didn't check it uh, until like early morning. Oh, you didn't uh, see? Yeah, it? yeah. So you wake up in the morning. There's a text in your phone, and it says, "What well, deal's dead." How do you feel? Off, well, terrible. Like heart sinks, stomachs like turning over. Like how do I? Like they soft. They didn't like deal dead. It was more like, hey, there's some complications with the deal. We can't close today. You know, this thing kind of give us some context. But you're feeling it. You feel it. We're like, what? Like, what do we tell our team? Like, we have this new office at the Samsung Next that we're supposed to be driving going to to start. Everyone's supposed to get their new offers. Everyone's supposed to be getting these like, you know, payout agreements and all this stuff. And we're like, this is supposed to be like a home run. Did you call the chairman and tell him he was an asshole? No, oh, I didn't deal with that. Uh, that was that was Ian's because like him and Ian were like he saw Ian as like his wonder kid, wonder kid. And so Ian could do no harm. So anything that ever went wrong with the business was pinned on me, despite the realities. So his chairman just blamed everything on me. So, or the chairman blamed everything on me. So it was just, it was not fun. Um, so I didn't try to cross that bridge at all. I just, we accepted the reality. Like there's no one to point fingers so at. What do you tell your team? They all come in at nine. Everyone's there. I forgot exactly. I know. Uh, Champagne was at the office. Well, no, we do. It was at the other office. Oh, okay. Because uh, we were supposed to, everyone's supposed to go get their, we we're supposed to make the announcement. Everyone's supposed to get their offers, sign, and go to the new office. That was, you know, the buses. Got it. Um, and, you know, we, I forgot what exactly we said. I think we said we we're going to have a big holiday party or something. I think that's what we told them. It's like, hey, you know, like, thanks for coming in at 9 a.m., everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a holiday party. And, like, Ian didn't even talk. Like, I, I'm trying to remember if he even came in the office or not. Um, it's like crush. Yeah. Oh yeah, and he oh, destroy. We are all destroyed, but you, know, you kind of have to like can't just tell everyone to come to the office at night and not not show up. Uh, so I think he just kind of stayed quiet, and uh, I kind of gave the news to everyone, and it was just heart wrenching. Just like you know, one no one can know, and uh, can they see through it? No one did. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all the nights, the subsequent nights, we were able to sleep. Like, like we were up all night. And I'm pretty, pretty sure I erased all that, you know, feeling from my mind. Um, I don't really remember. I'm, yeah, I was, we, 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 no, we had to like, we had to figure shit out. Like we were hustling because there was no time because we were running out of money. And the deal wasn't dead yet. We had a million dollar breakup fee and the deal wasn't dead yet. And so, term, there goes the answer. Set yeah. up the terms before you go into the deal. Exactly. So we had a breakup fee in case they screwed us, which they did. And thankfully we got that breakup fee. But we had to figure out like, all right, how are we going to fund this for longer if we don't get the breakup fee? Because if they don't kill the deal, then it's not dead and we don't get the breakup fee. And then, you know, what's our business model? Because this is not sustainable. Like we were like, and we're not going to be able to raise money now because we don't have enough money to last to run a process. So yeah, we were like on fire. Like there was no time to like cry and like be sorry. It was like the one day of just like shit. And then it was like, now what? So I think we, I think, yeah, we just, Got the board together and well, senior leadership and just like figured out a plan. Uh, I don't think we delayed it at all, actually. Um, I think we figured it out that day. So basically, we had to pivot to B2B. We had to start doing enterprise deals because we had to get them to fund everything in advance because right. there was no way we could fund the growth. Because, like, our pro like, customers paying 15, 20 bucks a month for the servers was never going to be sustainable for us uh, until we had hit, hit a certain scale. You know, until yeah. we had like, I forgot the numbers, but it was like a certain amount of like million users paying every single month. We were no nowhere near where we needed to be in terms of profitability. So the uh, the plan basically came down to like, all right, we got to find enterprise contracts. And Walmart had just sent me like a cold DM on LinkedIn saying, hey, you're doing something interesting. Can we have a chat? And I kind of went and dug deeper into that. And I'm like, hey, I think, Walmart would be interested in like talking to us from like a, not just a partnership, but a potential acquisition as well, given what I context I had and the conversations I had with them prior before having like a formal meeting, but our deal was exclusive and under the radar, we couldn't shop it. So, you know, our CFO was like, don't, don't engage with them until deal's done. And so <laughs> that day I was like, Hey guys, what's going on over at Walmart? Um, and you know, picked up the conversation right away and started having, um, pretty, productive conversations very quickly about doing like a million dollar POC um, to kind of get something off the ground for Walmart gaming. And then we approached uh, Verizon. We got a million dollar POC with them. 
and then um, LG, KT Telecom. I was like going all like the Mobile World Conference, all the big uh, kind of enterprise, you know, uh, and the 5G was coming out. So like everyone's like, we need use cases for 5G because we don't really need 5G yet. <laughs> Cloud gaming, that'll suck up a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's do these as case studies. So that was good timing. And uh, and of course, we're the nimble startup that can like hack together demos overnight and make them look good. So we're getting invited to all these like uh, uh, kind of like conferences and events to kind of demo the tech. And so, yeah, we quickly just forgot it. Like the Samsung deal officially collapsed. We basically said like, you have to kill it so we get the breakup fee so we have some money. And then we went back to our existing investors because at that point, I think we raised 10 total and then we got another two from investors, but they... This is where the knife comes in. They they hurt us pretty hard on those terms. So not just like price, but uh, warrants on it as well, and like pretty substantially low valuation. So it was a down round. And they substantial they down round. Granted, it's all notes, but, you know, technically down round. Yeah. And that, that crippled the payout when we eventually got um, bought for Walmart for around the same price as Samsung, but those terms, you know, paid up most of the... Um, up sale. Yeah, yeah it sucked. Sure. So, but we survived and got, now I get to say, ooh, we sold the Walmart, so, you know, it has its benefits. But yeah, it definitely would have been nice if we didn't get the uh, the knife twisted into us on that moment. But we had no choice. It was the only option. It was either that or, you know, declare bankruptcy. So it was like, all right, well, let's take the money and see what we can do with it and um, see if we can still drive to an outcome. And then, yeah, we signed all these like awesome enterprise deals, which were exhausting and a lot of like relationship building. I'm spearheading all these things, never done enterprise sales, and I'm having to like figure it out and like move up the chain, navigate these things. Um, but came out and just like basically made up numbers because like I just made sure we had to cover our cost basis. And then like I try to like quadruple whatever it was going to be to like give us some cushion and think about it, like how we get paid up front. Um, and prioritizing that so we have more cash so just trying to be strategic and creative as like how do we survive and uh, yeah Walmart just we kept building a really good relationship that kept moving us up the chain you know relationship kept getting stronger there was a clear vision Walmart was a very interesting organization they had like 30,000 engineers we would never know that but it's like it's a heavy engineering organization and it's just a lot of it's actually just building internal tools because mm. you think about it like oh this this service this like Product, productivity software costs $10 a user. Like, oh, we have a million and a half users. <laughs> like, it's probably cheaper to just build it ourselves. Granted, it wasn't always the sexiest tech, but, uh, but it works. Yeah, so they had a really big engineering org. We got to go and deep dive with all them because they were going to use our tech not just for cloud, Walmart gaming, but they're going to use our tech for a bunch of internal stuff. Uh, so there's some really cool stuff we were working on with them. I was really excited. Perfect uh, L&D tool, right? Low latency L&D. You know, that's, I do imagine. Well, what was uh, during uh, development? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a really cool strategy that we orchestrated uh, between Verizon and Walmart and us was to put bare metal servers inside Walmart stores because they're within 10 miles of 95% of Americans. Yeah. Now we went down that road pretty deep because also you put the 5G tower because the big problem they didn't have bandwidth. Yep. Like the, the, most of these stores had like still 10 megabit, mm -hmm. 100 megabit lines. Like it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so we thought about doing this whole strategy with. Verizon and Walmart and putting 5G towers and having like edge compute, GPU compute in their stores, let their cost per square foot, which is one of their main, or yeah. revenue per square foot is one of their main metrics. And long like, it's going to be huge what they could make. Um, so that was like part of the story and the narrative we had to craft. So when going into M&A, you got to craft a story, you know, don't rely on them to come to you with a narrative. You got to bring them the narrative. Um, with our strong relationship with Verizon, that is how we kind of brought that narrative to the, to play. And, um, and then ultimately, we knew we had to push towards acquisition. So Ian and I started really like putting, you know, head to head Verizon and Walmart. And she's like, oh, Verizon's talking to us. You know, they're, they're, they're going to do something. And then like Walmart's like, oh, shit, we don't want to lose these guys. Like, this is pretty cool. It's big, big, big bet. Uh, um, the ball. Yeah. So we we started like, you know, put, putting them against together. We pulled like LG. We pulled, like, we're trying to pull all these big, big enterprise brands and just show like, oh, hey, we're doing this thing with AT&T now. And they're like, oh, no, you can't do that. And uh, so we just kept trying to pit them against each other to get them to take action because otherwise they would just keep drawing out, give us a few bucks here and there and just like, yeah, we'll draw this out. Yeah. While well, um, you're burning cash every day. Yeah. Exactly. It was stressful as hell. Uh, I lost a lot of hair. Um, I, I had to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my hairline. Um, but yeah, we. Happens to the best of us. Yeah, no, right. 
uh, literally from stress. I mean, you're not, you're not joking. You're dead serious. Oh yeah, dead serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, like, it's still pretty thin up here, but cortisol will, yeah, death to hair follicles shoots out the hair. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was just like it was on my keyboard. It was nuts. Um, yeah, super stressful just navigating that that situation and just trying to also like keep morale up because we oh we we laid off like a third of the team because we laid off most of the consumer side of the operation like to keep it we kept it afloat but uh just for the narrative and testing purposes but we had to scale it back way back uh and focus on these um commercial contracts uh so yeah it was it was pretty gnarly pretty intense uh very sad to let all those guys you know people go and then um but then we got those contracts we got a little bit of money from the investors we hired a couple really strategic engineers and again part of the reason why we hired some more strategic engineers was we had a lot of overseas guys and like uh, Russia and stuff like that, but they're not marketable from an acquisition perspective. What's a strategic engineer just for the audience who doesn't know? So a strategic engineer from the perspective that I'm sharing it is if you are going to get acquired and you're, there's your vision and you have a technical product, a very technical product, you need top tier engineers because you can in some cases get, you know, two to 10 X what you're paying them in salary as terms of enterprise value. So if you have like a top tier engineer, um, that left Google to come work for you or left some big you know, firm and to come work for you. Like you can recruit talent with your narrative. That's where they're all trying to compete is trying to get the best tech talent. So they usually will pay like five, 10 X, whatever they're, you know, so if they, if you got a $250,000 engineer a year, you could probably get like a million to two and a half million added on to your acquisition price or it's like factored into the price. Yep. Uh, so we, we just look for these like resume stackers and people that just had awesome resumes, uh, so that we could help construct that narrative for the acquisition. Um, how long was the acquisition process with Walmart? It was exactly a year. A full year? Yeah. So no, no, no. So from the Samsung deal collapsing to starting the conversation formally with Walmart one year, uh, to the actual, you know, docs closing and deal closing at the end of, uh, to December 2018. How was that process? Brutal? Um, it was smooth in the sense that like we had everything dialed in already because mm-hmm. we had done it all for Samsung. So we were like ready to go. So it took probably about six months to get to the acquisition table and like the corp dev team. Um, and they saw the tech, they saw the opportunity. Again, work the narrative, work the narrative, sell the vision, sell the vision. Like you could have Walmart gaming, you know? <laughs> Uh, and we had to demonstrate that it's going to be a billion dollar line item because otherwise they don't get out of bed for anything less than a billion. Um, and so, yeah, we put together the narrative and just kept pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Uh, so it was really led by us because we knew we didn't have a choice. We needed a big sponsor to succeed because we knew with our narrative and especially after that capital raise, we were going to be able to raise them hundreds of millions that we needed. Um, so... Uh, just very strategic about the entire process all along the way. And just trying to keep everything afloat. Just whatever, the, you know, we, we have this one narrative, we got to do everything to support it. And a lot of our engineers, a lot of our team was like, why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. Like, just, just do it. <laughs> just trust me and do what you're being told. Uh, it was not fun communicating to our team that way on so many things because they were so committed to our vision and the gaming and all this stuff. That's why they joined. And we're like, you know, just running on the edge here, just like, just, just stay on board. Just keep going this path and don't look left, don't look right. Just You're like, guys, just please listen. I'm trying to get you to keep your butts in the seats. Yeah. And like, you don't understand. And you can't tell them. You can't tell them. You can't tell them, because, can't tell them the truth. Because fear is literally like the killer for, for creative productivity, engineer productivity. Yeah. It's like- Or unknown. Yeah. Fear of unknown. Like just like, what's going to happen if we're going to acquire? Do I lose my job? Like we cannot have them thinking that way because everything has to be like- Ship, ship, ship. Dial. Yeah. yeah. And, so- so you sign the deal, the wire hits. What's that like for you? Uh, I think the probably best moment was when I got to sit down. So we're in Walmart. We're, we're at the headquarters in Bentonville. And there's all this, you know, other things. But that moment when I get to sit down with him and we just had our kind of like. Is he, is he in or? Yeah, is he in and I. Got it. Uh, we're at the bar at the hotel. And we had just done like a day of briefings and like meeting all these people and stuff like the deal's done like officially that day and we were drinking some uh, old fashions at the the bar and i just you know like i could finally see the weight off him and not and then i finally like 
we just kind of have like a back and forth, like real conversation for like the first time in forever that wasn't just dialed around making this outcome happen. And it was just such a relief because we were button heads too, because we were just like trying to keep this all afloat. It was just so stressful. It was impossible not to butt heads. And it was just nice to have like a real conversation and just kind of like let go and just be like, the money's in the, the money's in the accounts. Like it's done. Like we did everything we were supposed to do. It was just like a huge weight off our shoulders. You know, new weight was go build Walmart gaming, but it was just so that moment. That mo- it's just the that one cheers, which is like <sighs> just the, all that exhaustion, just out in that one breath of just like wow. And um, and also him and I, we released a bunch of tension too because we finally could like share some. De- like I've been holding so much back from him. So that he was stay focused, yeah. like, because there was a bunch of drama at the office all around how he was doing stuff, and I couldn't tell him, and because he didn't react well to that kind of stuff, and so it was like kind of, yeah, coddling that information and not allowing him to, yeah. to know, which created a lot of tension with me from him. Uh, but when we got to lay it all out, having a drink, it was just like. Whoa. We both just like remember that time that I did this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. remember that. Yeah. Like, remember that thing didn't make any sense at all to you. Well, here's what happened. Yeah, did you tell the bartender like leave the bottle. Oh, we leave the bottle. Hammered by the end. I think we probably had like he was Russian too, so that means he was no. Yeah, no, no, he wasn't Russian. Oh, he wasn't the Russian. No, we hired a bunch of Russians. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Which awesome guys. I got to go to the so, World Cup. So soup to nuts. You were three, four years into this journey. So it was uh, started in 2000. Like end of 2015, early 2016 to ending and end of 2016, 18. So it was about three years. Okay. Yeah. Which is fast. So you Super were balls fast. to the wall running. It was nuts. Yeah. Would you do it again? Well, well, obviously not exactly. Well, I, I look. I, I, ask, I like that. I, I, I look back, right? And is it worth it? You go back to like those guys, those titans that cried to you about their family and this and that. You've now taken a bunch of journeys, but this one is like, I mean, three years is a short period. Yeah. And you're like balls to the wall. And after, after having a, a, a failed acquisition of your last company, stressful, hair falling out, all kinds of issues. In hindsight, was it worth it? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was worth it. Um, the journey, the experience, the knowledge that I gathered from that yeah. is 10x me and everything else in my life. Okay. Um, and it's opened up doors again, like being able to say you built a company and sold it to Walmart opens doors. And so those doors open and I get to kind of explore new opportunities, new investments, uh, you know, build new things. And, you know, I did it again for another company, uh, generation Esports. I built and scaled them after that. Uh, so basically after the acquisition, you became a Walmart employee, again, Walmart employee, which was a trip, my first real job. Um, and we were again still balls to the wall. Like we were on fire. Like I was meeting with every major publisher to negotiate all these crazy contracts to basically get their their games on our platform at launch. We were launching at E three, so we had six months from acquisition to basically build a enterprise scale platform that could handle millions of users like ASAP. And so that was a wild right. We grew from like, so we laid off some people, we hired some new people and then we got acquired and then we almost nearly doubled the team in wow. like that time. Uh, we recruited some Walmart people, we recruited some of the people from Verizon, we recruited like all these you know, people that we thought were top talent. We have money, <laughs> we want you, we want you, you. Yeah, so that was fun. Yeah, yeah, that was an awesome experience for those first couple months. But then about a week before announcement, bank consulting came to Doug McMillan, the CEO, CEOs of Walmart and said, uh, you're getting your ass kicked by Amazon for next day delivery. And you're spending four billion on all these like big tech projects that may or may not pay off. You need to reallocate that to next day delivery. So stop what you're doing and go do that instead. Definitely the right advice. It sucked for us because we were a six hundred million dollar budget line item for the next three years. They were going to give us six hundred million until it just light on fire for six, three years. And um, shut it down just like that. Were you tied to the success when you, if you stayed or were you? No, it was, it was just a, like a regular retention package, you know, no, no strings attached. So, um, so it wasn't too bad. So it didn't kill your earn out potential a bit. No, no, no. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I still got, I, I think I left a little bit of money on the table when I left. 
Um, but it was in, 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 inconsequential like, in terms of sums. But You were uh, living in Bentonville? No. <laughs> no that, <laughs> it actually worked out great because right before the acquisition, I had bought a house in Jersey that was a 10-minute commute to the new Walmart office in Hoboken. So it was like nice home run for me. But uh, yeah, so they shut it down uh, and they legit put it. So we were in this thing called the fishbowl. It was like a giant conference room. They scrammed us all into that little conference room. They uh, frosted the glass. We were a secret you know, project. I forgot what they call it. It was like Project Storm. Yeah, it was Project Storm. And uh, everyone, like, everyone's just like regular like employee at Walmart. They don't know. They're like, who are these guys? Like, what are, what are they doing here? And everyone wanted to know what's going on. We couldn't talk to anyone. And um, But then after the deal fell through, um, people got kind of divided up into New York and, you know, people kept the jobs and people quit. Um, but they allowed me to just stay on and they put us up on the roof, legit. Like there was a Regis on like the top floor. <laughs> they put us on the Regis just to like open up space for the people and like, hey, you're, you're just going to rest and invest. You just don't say anything bad. Don't knock us for anything. Just keep quiet. Be happy. Take your check. And I didn't know what to do with myself. I was definitely like, kind of a lost puppy at that moment because I was like grind, 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 grind and then just like said do nothing. Um, so I couldn't do that. And I got recruited to go to another startup uh, out of Kansas City called at the time High School Esports League. Just a bunch of very committed founders that would like give anything to keep this business alive but they were only doing like 100, 200k a year for like seven years. Um, they like living on ramen, delivering pizzas to make things work. Um, so after that Walmart acquisition I was like well I'm getting paid to do nothing so I and mean, they don't care about what I do as long as I don't badmouth Walmart. Um, so I'm going to go consult for like free. And Bring a new laptop to work. So you got like two laptops. I did. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I, I never used my Walmart laptop. Yeah. I hated that thing. Yeah. Oh my God. That thing was atrocious. Um, I guess that's the only negative thing I ever said about Walmart is that. <laughs> Strike that from the record. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the laptop was terrible. Uh, good. I don't know why the cor- all corporate laptops are the worst. I don't I know. know why they can't just give you a fucking Mac or something. It's reasonable. They give you these shitty like Dells that are like yeah, think pants <laughs> with the red dot. I finally negotiated. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No way. The eraser. My wife. Yeah, the eraser. Yeah. I used to call it. Yeah. Uh, I was fast with that fucking thing though. In college, man, I was, I had that shit, I dual booted it with Linux. Like, I, little, no, there like, you go. Little, the little, it <laughs> never worked because the drivers and legs back then. I was like, oh, the shit's <laughs> plug in the mouth. Yeah. But, oh, hey, that's terrible. So, you were just telling us a story about your, uh, these guys living off ramen, yeah. delivering pizza. By the way, our type of guy. We like those guys. Yeah. Um, don't heat it up in the microwave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, never. Yeah, exactly. The styrofoam is poison, right, Rob? Yeah. Huh. yeah. It's enough. Um, Always love this stuff. So esports at this time, I mean, uh, I, I got involved in sponsored esports games probably around 2015, 16. So mm-hmm. you're at 2019. So this is like peak e- esports, yeah. right? Peak esports, my that, Yeah. Um, so you were able to raise a bunch of capital. Mm-hmm. Um, is that why you came to the table to sort of legitimize them, show them how to tell the story? I was in love with the narrative of getting kids out of the toxic open internet out of the basement and into a classroom with like-minded individuals working mm-hmm. towards a common goal mm-hmm. that led to better school attendance, better grades, better participation, better overall student outcomes. It was a phenomenal narrative, but they were just on such an insignificant scale. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, well, you guys don't have to pay me my excessive salary. Like, let me just come in here and see where I can take this. Mm-hmm. And that triggered a couple investors to, to write a small check of around like, I think it was like 400K, 500K. Mm-hmm. that came with me coming in and that kind of really set us off and I came in I decided to go like full time shortly after that I was like alright just pay me chump change give me a few grand just to legitimize it uh, give me an equity agreement and let's let's run and so we started kind of really I started trying to legitimize the whole like inbound marketing because they had a bunch of students the student they were viral among students but they didn't have any kind of legitimacy amongst it and it was like how do you get the schools to actually pay for this? And that's where I came and figured everything out. So basically getting the schools to license the software, and then we gave them like curriculum and programming to basically create an esports program. And so we got, I had a really successful fall of 2019, I think it was. I forgot how much revenue it did, but it was like 500K. So it's like, or 300 to 500K, somewhere in that range. It was like huge. Yeah, four every annual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, uh, to step up from the ramen packages to the bowls. Yeah, now they got a real salary. <laughs> um, and so that gave us a lot of uh, legitimacy to go out and raise a little bit more money. And uh, so we raised from like small local funds and stuff like that. Had a bunch of meetings, some angels and stuff like that. I think we raised about like two million more um, at that point, right before uh, COVID hit. And then <clears throat> we actually got a term sheet uh, during co- uh, right before COVID for like a legit Series A, like right off the bat. It was awesome because uh, we just like spring was huge. Uh, the spring registration because it was very seasonal. Mm-hmm. Um, They're like fall season, spring season. Yep. And we just crushed it. And like I got the website dialed in. We started hiring, started bringing in talent, stuff like that. And it was just a massive acceleration. And COVID hit. That term sheet evaporated like right then. And there. Like we got the term sheet, I think March 14th. And then March like 17th, they pulled it. Um, because they had to shut down all their, because they like, long story, they, the investors had a lot of, uh, physical assets mm-hmm. that, uh, were compromised in the COVID and everything like that. They lost all their revenue streams. So they're just like, we can't be allocating money for fun stuff anymore. We got to do this. Sure. And they weren't real VCs anyways. So it was probably for the best. Uh, there were just some like local wealthy guys there. And, um, so we ended up hammering down, like, you know, like, okay, we got to figure this out. It was a, like crazy experience kind of like all right our customers are schools schools are not in session what do we do mm. uh, and how do we break through the noise of schools dealing with their own shit storms of like what do we do like how do we handle this like you know so um <clears throat> i rebranded the company to generation esports to kind of get us outside of schools only because we were high school esports league at the time and so we could kind of broaden our scope maybe look at other you know avenues to apply our technology and our platform um, and that legitimized us substantially in the market, uh, to kind of start recruiting, like we got the, um, YMCA or JCC, a couple other, like kind of, uh, after school type programs using the platform. Um, and then we started realizing like, wait, this is the only activity kids can do right now that's related to school. And so we started leveraging that to say, Hey, keep your students engaged, start an esports program while at home. And uh, that started getting, a, that gave us some attention. It wasn't really like a home run sales deal, but it like gave us some attention. Uh, and we kept maintaining the existing uh, programming that we had for all the students. So that like, again, gave us like, hey, we're, we're the only ones surviving mm-hmm. in this thing. Um, and so we kind of recovered pretty quickly in that situation. I would say by like April or May, things were back on track. At what point do you just ask yourself and sit down and have like a serious conversation in the mirror and say, is this is this my calling the the pivot? <laughs> like, cause it's just like it's just like one shit show after the next shit show, and 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 you're remarkably resilient because you come out of these one after the other after the other. Um, but like, you can't catch a break. I don't know if I'm attracted to it or not, but like, I I tend to always you thrive. Come in, I, I thrive. I thrive in chaos. Like, just yeah. very complex, convoluted situations. I usually can superpower. Yeah. No question. Exactly. I can kind of get everyone on track towards like one goal. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I actually do better. I think I have better outcomes in chaos. Mm. Yeah. yeah. When everything's smooth sailing, I get, I'm like, uh, what can I fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. I don't know. It's more of a, what comes and fucks me up. I don't really, yeah. I hope I don't fuck anything up myself. But, um, <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned interesting words uh, earlier and the, it just kind of came up in the, the conversation. Hard thing about hard things, right? Like one of the key, oh, yeah. key things that I took away from that book from Horowitz is like, are you a wartime leader or a peacetime leader? Yeah. And it sounds like you really thrive in that sort of chaos, mm-hmm. ambiguity, gray area. Um, the, the generation esports journey kind of took an interesting turn in terms of, you know, just you and the founding partners, not necessarily agreeing. Um, what was it ultimately that led to you getting things cooking with hustle fun, getting things going with the, the kind of thunder uh, as the next thing, just because it sounds like you got to this like inflection point and I don't know how much you want to go into it or not, but with uh, generation esports sounds yeah, like, yeah, I, I can share. So basically we, we started rapidly growing, uh, and we saw another opportunity to do, uh, sponsorships. So I started signing sponsorship deals and, um, and you know, and just, Again, like constant, everything was on fire. Like we were just constantly go, 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 go. Um, but we got into conversations with Altos, which is like a very large, prominent BC. They back Roblox, and so that was very appealing to us. They know gaming; they're you know Korean, so they know what's up. 
And um, <clears throat> so we landed them for, they invested $8 million to kind of legitimize our previous round. So totaling like $11 million, uh, for our Series A. I think at that time we were like a million and a half run rate or something like that. And this is like a year and a half, like less than a year and a half. And then by the end of Q1, we were on a $6 million run rate. So it was just like- And you led all these fundings or was it the Robin guy? Yeah, no, it was me. So that was a, that was a difficult- thing to balance because like I was the one orchestrating everything. So I, I was brought in to be CEO, but we took one meeting with investors and realized that was a bad idea because the narrative gets totally messed up because one, I'm technically a hired gun. So um, that doesn't really bode well with me, especially super early. Like this, you know, like we were so insignificant at that uh, stage. Like, oh, you're bringing in a CEO? Like, oh, well, you guys don't have your shit together. Right. So I came in as president and COO and that was a common agreement between me and the founders was like, this makes more sense. This allows me to kind of run the show, get everything up and going, but it's still their company and I still got to run everything by them. And um, so I would tee everything up. I did the deck, I did the materials, like teed everything up. We leveraged our power for intros to the, you know, um, uh, run investors and everything. And I would come in either in the first meeting or the second meeting, um, but I could never come in really lead the first meeting because then there's like a power shift dynamic mm -hmm. that the, you know, would concern investors. So I did all the work, but wasn't the face of the the fundraise in those situations. So I had to coach them and advise them, like kind of like, hey, here's what you're gonna say, here's how you answer this, here's what we're doing for this initiative, so that they can confidently answer those questions. Uh, and it was also peak of market. Like you can throw anything on the wall at that point and raise money. Uh, it was nuts. Uh, I was shocked that we raised as much as we did, uh, as quickly as we did. Especially considering all my other Back, you know, history. Bull market. Bull mar yeah, exactly. Bull market. It was nuts. Um, great valuation, great everything. Uh, the founder's like, oh, we want a higher valuation. It's like, shut <laughs> Like, you're taking this money. Let me <laughs> tell you about this story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you remember when you were eating Korea. ramen with no salaries? Yeah. Like, Korea, exactly. 2017. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it's just two years ago. <laughs> yeah. Back in that. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, I was just like, we're taking this money. No, don't, don't screw this up. But um, unfortunately, right after kind of getting the money, um, there was kind of this like, like sentiment of like, I need to move from New York to Kansas City. And I was just like, my wife, ever, ever. Yeah, you know, she left San Diego. She's not going to Kansas City. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and so that was, and my wife was pregnant and we started getting in a tiff over like certain deals. So I was like leading the charge on all these big deals. And they had these kind of side projects that I was like, like what their idea was good. The reality of the agreement, bad. Uh, and I just, we were button heads on that a lot. And it basically came to the conclusion that's like, this is not healthy. And I knew investors were not going to be stoked with me not moving. Uh, especially because we, we took the team to 65 people. I hired every single one of those people on the team. Uh, took us from seven dudes on as contractors eating ramen in what was a, basically a frat house for an office and got us like a, you know, 8,000 square foot space and or I forgot, it was big, big space downtown Kansas City. It was awesome. And we got like 65 employees and we're really ramping things up. But then, you know, just kind of, there was just too much negative energy and like they were good now. They could hire people. They couldn't like bring in new talent. So they didn't really have to have me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of like, all right, let's, Let's just go our separate ways. Was it so? The initial couple checks that you brought in were from your investors. So yeah, it was um, people that trusted you. Well, it was one of the not really a founder, but kind of like an early believer uh, who had brought me. as a friend of mine. He brought me in, and it was his investors that would say, "Hey, let's put money in this company if Jason comes in." Okay. Got um, <laughs> so and so it wasn't people that came from like Liquid Sky or anything. No, like that. I, I did. I, I did bring in money. Uh, so once those three guys came in, mm -hmm. uh, we had some capital. I brought in some previous angels that have backed. So some angels that backed me at Thunder, like uh, they've been with me since Liquid Sky. They back everything I do. Was it hard to to walk away when you did that and give these guys the trust that they were going to be able to t handle it without you? Yes. Yeah. Then I was right. I I wasn't aligned with where they were. I was like, we're going right. This is the venture scale path. This is what we're going to do. And they were like, no, let's go left. And I was just like, well, that doesn't make it. I, my brain just couldn't compute that. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I was just like, I, I don't think I can work with this anymore. 
Did they implode? Uh, they're, you know, they didn't accelerate and hit the goals that they had anticipated. Um, I'll leave it at that, but, um, I made the right choice. Yeah. I'm sure you did. Yeah. So then you founded Thunder. Um, yeah. Where'd that idea come from? Thunder? Yeah. Cause it's dramatically different from everything else. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was, you know, uh, burnt out a little bit. You know, my hair is all gone at that point, you know, mostly. <laughs> no, you're uh, back. You yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, same problems as it. So just much more, much smaller scale. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, kind of take a couple weeks just to kind of like take a break. Uh, this is probably May, June of 2021. And I started reconnecting my network in New York because I've been kind of absent from it for about a year or two with the Kansas City stuff. And I started reconnecting with some VCs and um these guys over at interplay ventures i've always had a pretty good relationship with i always liked them pretty well and we were just shooting the shit one day and they're like hey we got this idea like you know it seems kind of with your background of raising money and doing this and doing that maybe this might make sense for you and it's kind of like a they call it like their foundry but it's like a venture studio mm -hmm. and i was like i don't know like i don't know if i want to go down that path and so i sat on it for a couple months and we just had a couple more conversations, just like friendly conversations. They're introducing me to people in their network and like exploring ideas, meeting other people and just, you know, keep my options open. But then I started realizing like, I really love conversations around private equity and venture capital. It was just like, it's a lot of fun. And just like the, again, problem solving, like, chaos, like every startup's chaos, you know, in most cases. So it's like, I can be very helpful to a lot of those types of companies. And um, I was like, yeah, let me, let me go back to that idea. And um, so I struck a deal with Mark and Kevin, the partners at Interplay, and decided to launch Thunder um, kind of with their, you know, so we put all some money into it and then I raised a little bit of additional money for some of my angels, um, just kind of give us some like runway. And this is peak of market when we conceptualize it and I have a kid on the way. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna take it easy. I'm gonna have a kid. We're gonna get this like established. I'll have my mind working towards it, but I'm not really gonna like produce and like launch until probably about six months later. Um, so we, kind of conceptualized that we wanted to create like a, a marketplace originally connecting, um, you know, capital seekers with capital allocators. And we realized there was a ton of that already in the market. There's a ton of noise. It wasn't anything like super innovative or special. And most of them never really went anywhere. A lot of it had to do with the, them being SaaS models. Like, hey, pay us up front for, you know, thousand bucks or do whatever the price is. And we'll give you like a list of investors. Like, okay, that's not super exhilarating. Oh, well now you get like a fundraising CRM. It's like, okay, well, do I still really use that? I'm still going to be working out of my email. Um, so I kept the tech pretty light and we decided to use that more as a lead gen and top of funnel tool to build an investment bank off of top, uh, on top of, because rather than making a couple hundred bucks per customer, we can make hundreds of thousands uh, or tens of thousands. So, um, you know, we could be a lot more selective. We can't necessarily, you know, work with everyone from that capacity, but we can provide a lot of value to the ecosystem, providing free tools, free content. So we have like a debt finder tool, a VC finder tool. Um, we have our podcast, newsletter, all that kind of stuff. And uh, just all this kind of wonderful education for founders specifically looking at needing outside capital. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not just venture, but, you know, it's mostly venture. That's where the audience is. Um, but uh, yeah, so we built out, that kind of content platform and the the website and all that kind of stuff to help start facilitating top of funnel. We started getting a couple hundred companies a month signing up on the platform. Uh, obviously a lot were too early to really bring us on because like investment banking and venture doesn't really go hand in hand, especially early stage. But building that data warehouse. What was that? Building that data warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our focus basically became like, all right, look at the one, top 1%. One so we created all the algorithms and scoring mechanisms, all that kind of stuff. So we kind of like uh, know who we should be giving our attention to from like a service-based perspective. Um, and it was a disaster in the first like six months. Cause we launched when I finally got my broker dealer license and we can actually like charge a success fee and do all that kind of stuff. It's summer, 2022. So the market fell off a cliff. Right. <laughs> I'm like, all right, it's yet one more. I know, right? I just love I, I, I just have a question for you. I believe I have your skill thriving in chaos when everybody's crying and yelling and screaming and bringing problems like I can't tell you how often I get this one phone call from this one guy that goes we have a problem <laughs> or or uh is it it no it's not, <laughs> it's not me it's, it's not I have a call to a problem it's not him, it's not him. It's good he used to call me with we have a fire five years um but it's been a while yeah. so a long time but every time I hear that 
I have a visceral reaction to it, not because I'm afraid of the fire or the problem, just because I hate the way that it's brought to me mm-hmm. because it's never that serious. Yeah. And I have a scale for it. I've talked about it on the show many, many times. How do you identify people with our skill, with the skill to thrive in chaos, fight the impossible, the pitfalls, uh, and come out ahead? How do I find those people? What is it about you? Because your dad was a finance guy and your mom was a teacher, right? Like Librarian. Librarian, yeah. So she wasn't fighting fires. Paper, paper. But she knows how to navigate information. True. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank God for ChatGPT. Um, I guess, like, I don't know. Like, I, I had a pretty unique, uh, like, yeah. I, I kind of grew up, I would say, not necessarily chaos, but just like a, a difficult situation at home that worked out great. You know, definitely first world problems at the end of the day. But um, my parents going through what they went through and then like helping stay and staying together. And then that taught me a lot about just commitment to things mm-hmm. and not giving up when, you know, shit hits the fan. There it is. Uh, so I think that's a lot of what shaped me, especially mm-hmm. with my wife. Like our relationship is so strong and doesn't have any of those foundational issues my parents had just because we came in with such a strong foundational like communication. Yeah. Uh, and also we didn't have a kid until like, you know, eight years, nine years after being married. Mm. That helps a lot. Um, <clears throat> my brother was at my dad's graduation, <laughs> college graduation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think just kind of seeing what they went through, but no, they did not give up. They called in friends. So that friend that gave me the Rich Dad Poor Dad book was the one that was there when everything really went to crap with my parents and was like, kept them together. Mm. Uh, so that really was an important shaping moment in my life that I still reflect on often because I got to see my parents struggle through the difficult times and still be married today. Uh, and just knowing that things take things worth having take work. Mm, this is awesome. I yeah. feel like we could do a part two, part three, and part four to this. <laughs> yeah. This has been an awesome, just being respectful, your, your calendar. Yeah, you're, first of all, yeah. you're such a chameleon from photographer to, <laughs> to, 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 to this venture guy and investor and all your pitfalls and pivots. I mean, this, this is another great journey that we were able to go through with you. And we just want to thank you for being a part of this yeah. show. Thanks for letting me share the story. Yeah, thanks for coming on Forward Obsessed. And uh, we will include all that stuff in the show notes as always, folks. And how do they find you? Uh, you can find me on X at Jason Kirby or on LinkedIn at Jason R. Kirby on the URL. And um, thunder.bc, you can reach me if you want to email me directly, uh, jason at thunder.bc. And uh, and then, yeah, look up uh, Fundraising Demystified on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. Oh, hell yeah. This is great. It's a wrap. Awesome. It's a wrap. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Ford Obsessed. Please share this episode, subscribe, and leave a review on your podcast app. If you have feedback or suggestions for our next guest, visit us at forwardobsessed.com. If you want to dive deeper into every interview, subscribe to our Substack at forwardobsessed.substack.com. Also, find us on Instagram or TikTok at forwardobsessed to see all the best moments from every episode. This episode was produced by Robert Roach from District Studios in New Haven, Connecticut. If you would like to learn more about the team that makes the show possible, visit digitalsurgeons.com.